Okie dokie. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Where's my window? There it is. Okay, so on tap for today, action items and work group updates and a lot of discussion about all the action items. Um, so first up would be the Hackfest preparation uh, and updates on the upcoming Hackfests. Um, yep. And then we've got uh, Bill's proposal on the maturity of the software. Uh, I think Bill and Jeremy were going to go off and, and take a look at um, some of that. And then um, uh, we have exit criteria. So Arno, we're going to hopefully finish that up um, along with the, the update you've made to the project lifecycle for the naming uh, taxonomy, if you will. Um, and then um, Brian, did is this 0 0.1? Is this the one you sent before? Actually, I should have looked at this last night. I, I think it's been updated to 0 0.2. Um, oh, okay. uh, the, the link is accurate. I think it's just, yeah. Okay. Except that, um, the, yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Okay. All right. And then um, then we'll review, Todd, uh, the, the contributors that we've collected thus far, and uh, people can uh, take a look at those. And I think, you know, what we should entertain at this point in time is, uh, we should we should probably discuss how we pull the list together and then get feedback from the DC as to whether or not they think we might have missed anything. Um, and then um, there's a Hyperledger Explorer proposal out there, but I don't I haven't gotten feedback from Dan and Parda, so I think we'll table that until um, the face to face maybe. Um, and then we'll have to work group updates unless there's anything else anybody would like to bring forward. Chris, I just heard from Dan. He's um, interested in the Explorer. He said something about the scheduling being still a couple weeks out. Yeah, I think I have the same problem in terms of actually getting the software out there. Um, in terms of the proposal, maybe we could have it so that next week we could at least um, start finalizing it anyway. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mick. Um, Chris, I just came back from vacation, so um, I'll start taking a look at the documents you gave. Oh, in the you gave me vacation. Okay, I was wondering why I didn't hear back from you. <laughs> that, that's perfectly fine. So uh, anyway, it's out there, and, and we'll uh, we'll get to it quickly. Okay. All right, so Todd, uh, Hackfest prep and uh, the, the All right, so uh, first quickly on the dates, uh, the San Francisco Hackfest is next week. As everyone knows, if you haven't registered, please do so ASAP. Um, the August Hackfest has been confirmed. Uh, it will be virtual August 24th and 25th. And the European Hackfest in fall, we are tentatively looking at October 3rd and 4th, which is a Monday and Tuesday following Cybos. Uh, it would be in Amsterdam. We will be firming that up uh, likely today or at least in the next couple days to have a, a final date for the TSC next week. Um, in terms of the Hackfest for next week, we threw a couple topics into a draft agenda just from the discussion last week. Uh, I'm dropping that into the chat window right now. Uh, it's also in the agenda that went out. Uh, so if there are other topics that you'd like to see get slotted in um, or specific conversations or work groups happen at uh, different times over those two days, either put a comment in the doc, uh, send me a note uh, so we can get uh, those, those different components slotted in. And if there's any suggestions at this point of things people would like to see get added, um, please raise that at this point. Hi, this is Brian. Um, we will have Rye Jones um, from the Linux Foundation on site. Um, who uh, He's been helping, uh, he's been talking with Chris and others about the transition to Garrett um, as well as uh, to Jira. Um, and uh, I can walk through what that, what the implications of that are, and and uh, um, you know, and, and perhaps even do some training around that. So, but we'll we'll have them there for both days, so we should make the most of that. Awesome. Anything? Hey, uh, Todd. Sorry. Um, hey, Todd. Uh, this is Hart. Uh, we've discussed possibly starting to put together a uh, GitHub repository for some of the documentation stuff. And some people and I were looking at starting to set that up uh, next week, if that's all right. 
Excellent. We'll get that that slotted in as an agenda item. And if there's a specific time frame you'd like for that to happen there, uh, let us know. Otherwise, we'll just run that non-conference format and pull pull a group together. And and so, Hart, just to make sure I understand, this is for sort of top level hyperledger, non-specific to any given project documentation, or yeah. So um, so like yesterday in the architecture work group, we discussed starting to put together some of the architecture documentation. Um, you know, I know the white paper working group is not quite ready to move to sort of a formal LaTeX white paper, but we've discussed possibly doing that in the future and sort of having the infrastructure ready to do that when we potentially want to do that would be nice. Ah, okay. All right, fair enough. Just just want to make sure I understood. Thanks. This is Jeremy. I would I would I would second the need for that. Um, as someone, for example, who has read-only access, read access to the repositories, that means I can edit the wikis, but I can't actually upload any files. And so that it would definitely be a help to be able to have some, some place to put things like that. Okay. Another uh, topic. Uh, this is Brian, that I'd like to see added is I would um, like to see the two major projects and, I mean, Explorer, if it's ready, um, uh, but the, at least um, Fabric and Sawtooth Lake um, start to talk about with the, with the rest of the developers um, what the path is to a, um, a 1.0, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, using our, our guides, the documents we're coming up with now, but uh, I'm trying to get a sense for just what is the next you know, what do the next two, a couple of quarters look like, um, uh, and what stands between us and um, some sort of minimally viable release that we're happy to hang our hat on? Um, I know there's a lot of variables at play, but um, those of us who talk a lot to the world about about the state of things would love a, a guide to appropriately set expectations to, um, and, uh, and and it'd be great as a project just to have some targets, you know, and, and measure our progress against them. Great. Uh, any other topics before we move on? All right. Sounds good. Uh, Chris, I think we can move on to the uh, maturity of software discussion at this point. Yeah. So let's actually do this um, in reverse order just so we can get the exit criteria out of the way. So Arno, can you start and sort of catch us up on where we left off last week with the exit criteria, the updates you made, and, and hopefully we can get these approved. Yes, hi. Uh, so, well, I mean, the, the document itself hasn't changed much. The main change has been to rename uh, mature state to active. And so I made that change to the project lifecycle document as well. I think everything is square. I moved out the material, like background material, and the material that Jeremy and uh, Bill had uh, contributed. That I moved to a different document. So when it comes to the to the ex incubation executoria document, I think it's pretty much done. There is only, you know, uh, I think one thing that was left is the towards the kind of, you know, more precise uh, exit criteria that projects might want to set for themselves at the onset of the the, the project. Uh, I had some examples and none of them are complete uh, if anybody wants to su suggest any. But these are just examples anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I think for the crux of the document, I believe we are, we are done. So I think it just needs to be approved and we can, you know, Finalize it. So, um, hold on, let me just. Uh, 
works. And of course, like we did for every other document, like the project lifecycle document, we just updated. We can always update that document, right? It's not cast in stone. Uh, <clears throat> if there are, you know, if anybody has any other suggestions, we just have to, you know, get an agreement on how to modify the document moving forward. But we can always update it and improve on it. Right. So let me just um, paste this in. So there's the there for everybody. The link in the chat. Um, so why don't we um, just sort of go around the room and and uh, take a roll to approve this. As All right, so Chris, you want me to do a roll call vote? Uh, yeah, please. Thanks. All right, uh, so uh, to approve this, uh, so running to the TSC members, uh, Stan from CME Group. Uh, yes. All right, uh, Parda? Yes, it's from myself. All right, Hart? Yep. Chris? Yes, please. Mick? Yes. Dave? Dave, you may be on mute. Sorry. Uh, yes. All right, great. Uh, Richard? Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure what I'm being asked to approve. Is it the Project Incubation Exit Criteria doc, or is it something else? Yes, yes that is correct. Okay, so um, so I, I'm 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 happy with it from the sense of the conversations I've had, but I've not read it. And the one I'm looking at at the top says in big letters, "This is a draft." So, what am I actually approving here? This is the final version, or that this is on the right track? So what's the actual question? That this is the well, it's final until we amend it. <laughs> yeah, the whole point is to remove the "This is a draft" note. Yeah. Right. Okay. Got you. Got you. Okay. So, um, um, I, I, just for the, for the sake of good order, because I've not read this most recent version, I'm going to abstain. Not because I disagree, but because in good conscience, I can't vote for something I've not read. So, um, so, so I, I, I don't object, but I, I haven't read it. So, so it's, it's not safe for me to approve. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ajit. Um, I'll have to explain as well. Sorry, I need to read it uh, before I can go otherwise. Okay, and then finally, uh, Andreas in for Stefan. Yes. All right. Uh, so with that, we have uh, seven yes and two abstain. Uh, so that passes. Okay. Thanks. And then uh, Arno, I think the the other change was just to. Change uh, mature to active in the lifecycle document. Is that correct? That's right. And I looked around for any other references. I couldn't find any. And I have to say, I didn't find it very easy to search our, our website. But that's a different topic altogether. I was trying to, you know, do a ma massive search throughout the whole web hyperledger website for references to mature. And I, I couldn't really do that. There's like the GitHub search, it only searches the code pod, but not the wiki, and the wiki doesn't really have a search. I was like, hmm, not the best. So I don't know. But again, that's a different topic. Uh, the document, the important thing is the lifecycle document itself has been updated, and this document now refers to the right name. So, um, I guess we should probably approve this one too, just to get everybody on board. I, I don't know if you need to do that. There was an approval last week to change the name from mature to active. Oh, the document that, reflects the decision. That's right. So this is just making that real. Okay, fair that's enough. That's right. So unless anybody has a, an objection, I think we should just move on to our... All right, sounds good. <clears throat> okay, now we take on uh, Bill and Jeremy. And uh, I think I saw an updated proposal, although I haven't had a chance to dive into it. So um, is one of, I hope, hope they're both on. Chris, if I may, just one more thing on the exit criteria document. I'll do like I did for the other documents, like the project lifecycle, 
where this is in Google Doc now, so I will move that content to the wiki. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, Jeremy or Bill, one of you guys want to, um, here we go. Yeah, this is Jeremy Severide. Um, per, per the discussion uh, over the last couple weeks, uh, Bill Sparks and I uh, had some on, uh, offline conversations about uh, some, of, some of what we've discussed around incubation and the software maturity. And we don't exactly land, in, I think, in either one of those. But where we did land was somewhere around expect, uh, risk management for the, for the use of the software. And so we want to just briefly talk, talk about that. So this is really sort of farther out there than a release 1.0 and, and the like. But it, it's about if, if the Hyperledger project succeeds and it's the pr platforms used in production, what could go wrong? You know, this is a good problem to have. This is not, this is something farther out. So for that reason, this may be something we want to table to a later time. But these are some of the examples of some of the things that have happened that conceivably could happen if someone's using the Hyperledger platform. So for example, smart contracts could get hacked. Uh, there could be uh, uh, an undetected disk failure. These are all just coming, uh, these four examples, things like fraudulent payments being issued, these things have happened according to uh, news reports recently. And these are things that could have some serious effect. And granted that there is a uh, uh, an Apache disclaimer and limitation of liability, it's a question of whether or not this is something we should address at all. But that's uh, that's the direction we're going in. Going in is what do we do about these about something like this? And some of it can even be for things that seem innocuous. So, for example, um, Bill, do you want to talk about the the example where the archives aren't destroyed on time? Uh, yeah. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, for, for example, one of the things we talked about was, uh, or an application potentially, is records retention. So in here you can see archives are not destroyed on time, it was, it was uh, discovered during a routine audit. But that could go from bad to worse in a hurry in the event of some sort of a security breach and documents with personally uh, identifiable information are compromised. Uh, that shouldn't be there in the first place because they should have already been purged. So that exacerbates the problem. And then when you when you actually, if you want to take that to the uh, asset size of a bank, for example, uh, in addition to your promontory uh, regulator being the FDIC or OCC, uh, if the bank uh, net assets are worth more than $10 billion, you could potentially uh, have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau added on at that point. So I think that's the kind of things we're looking at, and he's going to get to it a little bit later, but identifying risk in some of these uh, uh, intended application usages uh, that, the, that, the, uh, that the maintainers and, and folks introduce into the hyperledger for uh, incubation. So one of, one of the standard ways to deal with this is to start doing things like, <clears throat> excuse me, risk assessment workshops or worksheets where you sort of list out the risks, think about what the, how often these things are likely to happen, think about how would you control for these, and then what's left over when you, when you do that. And so 
that's part of the exercises that we're going through in things like the requirements working group and elsewhere. When we think about things like the illities about what do you have to what do you have to do to make this thing robust, resilient? An approach like this could blend very well with that in terms of helping to understand not just what the edge case scenarios are, but what are the controls that people might need to put in place? Because in some cases, those are things that could be in software. It can be, for example, part of what the code the configuration does, and some of those may be outside of the control of what the software can do. And in some cases, for example, for example, with the smart contract hacking, the fact that they had to go to and do a hard fork of the whole public chain is a is a, a fairly drastic step. And so it's something to just keep in mind that Different, different challenges, different controls, but this stuff is already happening. And so it's something that we at least probably want to think about encouraging projects at least to think about, even if we decide to table something like this. And Bill, you want to talk about where folks are using this kind of analysis framework? Well, this particular risk assessment worksheet came, uh, you know, this is a Defense Department uh, form that all branches of the military use, and we've just kind of adapted it, and there's many, many others out there, but they're all closely linked. But I think the point that Jeremy was trying to make, and I now, you know, agree with him, is that uh, for, each, for each proposal for incubation, there should be a, uh, a set of risks associated with uh, that, that we can basically put forth in a canned uh, scenario. In other words, if you're doing a medical retentions uh, or medical records uh, retention type of, of uh, incubation, then there should be risks associated with that that are somewhat off the shelf that we can, that, you know, that you can pull in and, and, and do a lot of the work ahead of time. And then, uh, of course, when you get to your mitigation uh, control measures, and mitigation and control measures, you can, at that point, assess what your residual risks are and, and go from there. So, uh, and whether you agree or disagree with some of the uh, uh, FIPS 199 uh, categories, that's something for the working group uh, to put forth. And, and uh, But I do think that uh, a lot of these risks can be identified ahead of time so that uh, when, when something's pulled in incubation, there's almost like a database, if you will, of risks that they can pull from. And of course, they can add their own as they uh, identify them in the development process. And of course, one of the things that we, we've already been doing in the, dis the discussions, whether it's in the architecture working group, identity working group, protocols, We've started talking about features of the system that, in effect, are tied to SLAs and tied to risks that are, that we know are out there. And so this, is, rather than sort of putting the cart before the horse, is saying, okay, let's at least list out some of the risks, categorize them, and then try and be explicit about tying them out to the requirements. So for, so, for example, you know, we know that disk failures, failures happen. We know that the system availability is an issue. We know that some level of fault tolerance or resilience, some, mecha, some various mechanisms to cope with this are going to be necessary within the, pl the, the platform, which may be over and above the consensus mechanism. But this is just sort of trying to tie a lot of what we've talked about, and I think part of the challenge in the incubation discussion and the reason why it crossed over into the sort of software maturity was there are things that people know from past experience that we're going to have to deal with, whether it's performance, throughput, and the rest, that we need to get into some framework so that we at least know whether we're identifying it or, or we've chosen not to work on it. And 
the, part of the reason for this, and part of the question about this, is this, this originally came up in the identity working group where we had a discussion about con concerns about that people take Making the, the hyperledger code once it's once it's ready, and doing something with it that is goes goes awry, and then that blowing back onto the whole pro effort and the whole project. So cur currently, as I understand, as we understand it, something like the Apache 2.0 disclaimer warranty and limitation of liability is going to be in there. But the question is, is that sufficient? Now, maybe it is. But another way to tackle that would be to work through a, ri a risk approach like this, not to say that we're going to make a judgment about the risks, but to tell folks who are going to use this, not just we disclaim all warranty and limitation of liability and we made a reasonable effort to have the software perform the tasks and that there's a community behind it, but that if they're going to use this for the kinds of things we think they might, they really ought to do a risk assessment. And hey, here's a bunch of risks that we think are maybe applicable. Here's a way to think about them. And here, like, why don't you go fill something out? So at the very least, when somebody downloads this, there'll be something there that we can say, not only did we warn you that something might happen, we gave you a way to even think about it. So that's sort of the direction we're going, we thought might be interesting to go in, recognizing that this may be something that we want to table for a later point where, we, where we've got Code, code up and running and out there, but we think in part given some of the nature of where we think this might get used and where we and some of the high profile problems that have already surfaced that this is at least something we ought to think about. Final slide is just a series of references and citations to some of the work that we've talked about in in this forum and others, as well as some of the places where we pulled and assembled some of this from. And again, these are just ex examples. And this may certainly be something we want to table for an, for another time. So totally under uh, totally understandable. <clears throat> um, let me add on that. If you when you're looking at the references and citations, one that was just in the news this past week is the very last one on the list, which is the bottom right. This was a Citigroup thing that was. Uh, this was a a program they've been running for about 15 years. And some of you guys may be familiar with this. But what happened was uh, there was a software code ish, uh, error that. Uh, that ca that caused the problem, and when Citigroup fi found out that it that, that it was in existence, uh, it was not disclosed. So I think that's what got them in hot water. But they did end up paying a seven million dollar fine on this thing, and so I think that it would be worthwhile to go to that link and, and read. It's a very short article, but uh, read about it. And that's the kind of thing exactly like we're talking about. We need to understand, you know, what the risks are at least. Uh, let people know, uh, provide some references where they look for. It's not, it's not all risk in, uh, included, but just the ones that uh, uh, that we can can easily identify going into virtually any project. And then, as I say, as they develop and the and the and the thing becomes more complex, if the uh, maintainers uh, choose to do so, then they'll have to add some you know additional risk in there. I appreciate everybody's time on this, and uh, we put forth a good bit of effort in it, and thank Jeremy very much for all his work. Thank you, Bill. I, thank, thank you both for this. this is, I think this is very good. I think there's, you know, there's a couple of aspects to this I think that you know, are probably worth you know, following. Uh, um, the first would be we should probably explore, so what does the Linux kernel do for this? Um, I think there's probably similar types of 
you know, liability and risk and so forth involved. And so it'd be interesting to sort of explore if there's anything that we can learn from that project. Um, then there's the, I mean, I think then there's just a, a couple of other things. Then is the, and I'm, I'm going to get it, core, is it core infrastructure? <laughs> I apologize, guys, but I, I can't keep track of every name. Um, is it the core infrastructure project? Um, is that the name? You mean, uh, Chris, you mean the, the core infrastructure initiative, the TII? Initiative, thank you. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and so I think uh, we've already uh, sort of, uh, we've, we've talked about, we don't think we've done, you know, an actual engagement with those guys and got a briefing and so forth. But I think that there's probably um, a good deal that we can learn and, 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 and benefit from with, uh, uh, from that. And then, uh, you know, just when we do actually get to the point of actually starting to put out releases that people are starting to use in anger, we will have to put in, and, and to this, this was, I think, to maybe the city point at the end, um, some sort of a um, uh, vulnerability um, uh, uh, process in place so that, you know, people can report privately vulnerabilities, they can be explored and remediated um, or not, as the case may be, and, and then, uh, you know, announced, you know, obviously carefully because we don't want to be in a position where, we're not saying these things, but we probably do want to have a situation such that people that are delivering software uh, offerings that are based on the Hyperledger project outputs that um, there's a vehicle to let them know uh, first so that they can apply the, the, the remediation um, in, their, in their offerings before we actually tell the rest of the world so there's no zero-day exploits. Um, so I, I think all those things, I think we need to sort of follow up on, but I think this is a good summary of, of the kinds of things we need to be aware of. I, I, I agree with that. It's Richard Brown here. It's a couple of other thoughts. I thought that was really helpful, especially the, well, not only, but especially the, the links on the last page. Um, a, a couple of reflections from, from some of the work we're doing with, with our members. One of, one of the thought processes we've gone through and I think is relevant here as well is, is to ask ourselves, what is different about this space? So there are, there are, there are similarities, and uh, I take Chris's point about the Linux kernel and, and elsewhere. But there's also some interesting um, thoughts that arise when you ask me what is what is different or what is special about blockchain. And one that one that stands out for me that I think has two two implications for, for, for this space is one of the things that's different is that this is about building um, you know, shared agreements, coming to shared consensus between mutually distrusting parties um, you know, in different legal entities. So the software is never it, it, it doesn't make sense to think about deployment of the software by by one firm leaving aside internal deployments. So, so we're necessarily in the world where multiple organizations or multiple people are agreeing to deploy an application or a solution running on top of the software um, at once. So, so immediately you're in the domain of, you're immediately in the legal domain, what agreements have to be in place between those, those, those people. Essentially you're, you're, you're building a service whether, whether, whether you choose to look at it that way or not. So, so what governing agreements, whether they're master agreements or whether they need to be there. And then to what extent is the code expected to dominate or to what extent should its power to the extent it has any um, be delegated to it from overriding legal agreements which then provides a place to put things like dispute resolution and escape clauses in so that we have a path not only to, to mitigate the, the, the risks or reduce the risks of, of technical problems but there's a path for how we resolve them even when they inevitably um, occur. And then, and then the final thing on maturity, one of the things we, we think it's important to think about is um, how the ledger is used. So for any given use case, it, 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 it seems unreasonable to assume it will be fully automated and fully authoritative for the facts on it on day one. Perhaps it would be a shadow or a, you know, a, yeah, you know, it'd be a data propagation let until we're more, we're more confident with it. So there's the maturity of the software, but there's also the maturity of the uses for which it's put. So I, I thought that was it. So long story short, I thought that was a, it was a useful, useful paper you took us through. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Hi, this is uh, Ram Jagadeesan here. Uh, so this uh, topic of security and risk came up in the architecture work group as well. Um, and, uh, you know, wanted to bring it up here uh, because we were trying to figure out whether some of these, uh, you know, we should take on in the group or not. 
uh, within the architecture work group or not. And that, uh, so um, I think our initial thinking was uh, uh, security um, um, functions um, like identity services, policy services, which certainly are need to address in the architecture work group. But there's the second topic of what are the security reviews that need to happen uh, on the Hyperledger um, implementations. And that uh, uh, broke down into two levels. One was security review, um, security review by the uh, re uh, security research community, as well as uh, the code audit uh, for security purposes. So um, both of these, um, uh, I think, need to be kind of addressed head on. Um, now, um, which forum that needs to uh, happen uh, was something that I wanted to bring up uh, here so we can have a discussion uh, and figure out what is the appropriate uh, way to uh, deal with the security review for our implementation. And as pointed out, these are very valid risks. And given, um, uh, and given the importance of security in the application uh, domains we are trying to, uh, uh, to address, uh, I think we, it's very important for us to have a plan of how to go about doing that. Thanks, Ron. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I, so just for, for my own sake, I think, you know, Ram, I think I think it's probably worthwhile to sort of take on some aspects of those. I think the, the security review, we should probably also talk with Christopher uh, Allen and his team because I think they're, uh, that, that group is likely to have a lot of the expertise we're looking for. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, Christopher Allen was the one who, Brought up the topic in the architecture word group. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Okay. All right. So, Todd, what was next? I'm trying to go from memory and I don't have the agenda in front of me. All right. The next thing up is um, the uh, release taxonomy. Yeah. yeah, and for that, um, last week what we talked about was that um, the semantic versioning uh, uh, standard was something that um, I felt at least captured better, um, uh, you know, what, what we could be doing than, um, than my attempt at least to try to <laughs> restate it uh, poorly. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I think what we were going to do is ask that people take a look at semzare.org, I think it is. Um, and come back here and see if that's um, something that we want to adopt. Maybe that wasn't as clear as an action item as it could have been. Um, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at, at mzero.org. I have, um, certainly. I thought I had, I'm trying to, um, Let me look at my drafts here. I thought I had sent or written something up. I was essentially proposed. I, I was writing up a proposal that sort of took Semver and then mapped it to uh, to um, uh, to your taxonomy, uh, Brian, in terms of you know the. Uh, alpha, beta, and so forth. <clears throat> I think that there's still a need to have some sort of tag indicating, you know, how ripe something is uh, besides just a, a number. Um, and so I think that that, you know, having a taxonomy like that is important to complement. That, that, that's good. That's for really itself. For what, yeah. 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 So that's what alpha, beta means. That sort of thing. Good point. Yeah. Right. Uh, Semver provides for there to be a sort of a, um, an appended, uh, you, you, you know, alphanumeric kind of thing. You can do that with things like release candidate numbering and and so forth when you're iterating through and and finalizing something. Um, and I thought I sent something, but I'm, I apologize. Or we could simply turn it turn it existing um, taxonomy document around and say the version numbering is as defined by semfair.org, but we 
textual descriptions for what each stage represents um, uh, still hold. And I could I could create a version 0 0.3 that uh, uh um, did that. I think that would be useful. Maybe we can review that at the face to face. Yeah, I did send out something. Um, in 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 the, in the email. Although it wasn't it wasn't a formal, and I think it would be I I, I could make it a lot more formal. Um, okay, why don't I take it then as an action item to um, just make that uh, small set of mods there, and then we can talk about this uh, quickly at a uh, um, or review this um, at the uh, face to face at the hack session. That sounds good. Okay, I'll do that too. Thank you. All right. So next up is the um, you know preparing for the uh, for the six month um, elections for the technical steering, and uh, so one of the aspects that's in in our charter is we have you know six month get to know you period for the TSC during that period of time, the TSC members are appointed by the premier. Uh, sponsors, um, uh, but that, that following that, there would be um, an expectation that we would have uh, over that six months gotten to know each other a little bit and figured out who the community, those who've contributed in some way, um, feel the, that they would like to see on the technical steering committee. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, in order to do that, we have to assess, so who's made a contribution? Who are the contributors to the Hyperledger project generally? Um, and so we did, uh, what we did was we called the, um, uh, the GitHub committers. So all the people that are listed as committers in the various projects are, um, uh, they, uh, they get a chit, if you will, or they get a vote. Um, and so we've got a list of those individuals by email. I think we may have to figure out who's who um, uh, through that process. But the, anyway, we have those emails. Then we have, um, uh, I asked uh, Todd uh, to ask the uh, chairs of the various working groups who's, um, you know, been an active and um, uh, an active contributor to their efforts. Um, for a couple of those groups, it was pretty obvious because they had a list of the contributors where, uh, so we actually, we took those lists, so that's the requirements and the, um, uh, and, and the white paper working group, and then we asked Rom and Christopher and, um, and Oleg to, uh, to provide us with the people that had um, uh, been active and um, helpful in contributing towards the requirements, and so, um, uh, and so we came up with this list. I think um, uh, Todd, do you want to paste that in there? Is that what you just pasted? I can't, no, that was the other. Ah, you just did now. Good. So that's the the spreadsheet with the list. Um, I would encourage people to look through it. <laughs> um, there should be some duplicated I'm names. Sorry. In it. There seems to be some duplicated names, so we may need I think, to. Uh, I think they're likely over. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll we'll go through and do some uh, cleaning up of that, removing duplicates, and also adding uh, people's names next to the email, just so there's a, a better view. Um, we'll get that knocked out before the end of the week, uh, and then continue to review this leading up to the August 11th election uh, nomination phase, at least. Um, so if you are listed in here and we need an email, we're probably going to need an email from you. Um, so like David and, and Frank and Ram and so forth, I think we need emails. Um, and I can go through and do some manual work there and drop those in. I think oh, we have we have some of them. It just it just hasn't okay. happened yet. All right, I wasn't sure about that. Um, and then. Um, um, well, anyway, so that's how we pulled together. So what I guess we should be asking is, uh, of the members of the TSC, have, do we think we're missing anybody? In terms, not, not individuals, but in terms of, um, have, have I, 
uh, ha have we um, overlooked any obvious uh, means of contribution? I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we've already got these people. I wonder. That I'm guessing there were people out there who are actively building on either STL or, or, or Hyperledger Fabric who aren't, aren't necessarily contributing to the build of either of them but are using it in anger. Um, I don't know how we'd identify them if we haven't already or um, who they are, but I wonder if, so clearly they, as, as users, they'd have a useful voice and I wonder whether we'd count you know, constructive early usage as contribution and if so, whether they should be um, encouraged to apply as well. It's a question, I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, I think that's a um, I think that's a, a, a fair uh, point. Um, in other groups that I've worked with, um, the end users um, do get a voice, uh, but there's a process for figuring out who they were. Um, uh, like so, for instance, OpenStack went through this, and it was a little bit awkward initially. <laughs> Try and avoid the awkwardness, but. Um, you know, they just sort of said anybody who thinks that they're a quote unquote member of this community can sign up and be a member of the community as an individual. It didn't cost you anything. There was no uh, requirement to, um, uh, you know, to have contributed or anything. I mean, you could just be a user and, 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 and that, that sort of adds you to the membership. And they use that for some initial elections. The problem with that, of course, is that we ended up, we saw people signing up, and there was a bit of um, uh, ballot box stuffing going on. Unfortunately, I'm not going to name names, but there was some of that going on. It was a little bit unfortunate, um, and then <clears throat> then they they changed things a little bit, and so then the the elections for things like the the analog to the technical steering that they have at OpenStack. Um, were then restricted to somebody had to have literally landed a patch um, uh, in, uh, to, to, to get a vote in, in, a, in, a, in a given year. Um, and, and then there was pushback that said, well, but what about the users? And then they created some sort of an end user um, community, but it was, you had to be contributing in some meaningful way. So. I guess what I'm saying, Richard, is I, I think that that's right. I just don't know that at, at this point in time with the early state of the software that we have a vehicle to actually find those people legitimately. And no, that, that makes sense. No, I wasn't aware of the, um, the, the open stack um, problem, so yeah, it'd be good yeah. to avoid the same thing. Yeah. It, it was a little bit awkward. I, I, I agree, though, very much with your with, with the point that we should find a way of giving end users a voice, I think the question becomes how do we give them a voice and to what, um, uh, you know, what types of decisions are, would, uh, would they be uh, included in from a, a voting perspective? Any other thoughts from anybody in terms of obvious groups or obvious means of contribution that we may have overlooked. Oh, I, I didn't mention most chairs are all automatically added as well. Uh, they've, they've done quite a bit. We also got all the uh, contributions. I don't know if there have been any, um, but uh, contributions to the wiki um, that may have been separate from commits and, and work group participation, right? <laughs> I, I have to look at that. I'm not sure that I can. Um, that, that's a good point, um, and, and I'll explore whether or not that you can actually figure out who made the contributions. Through, if there's, I mean, with with GitHub pull requests and issues, it's fairly simple to sort of use the GitHub APIs and figure out who the contributors are. Um, not so sure about the wiki. I, I could look to see if there's an API that will. To, to, to use. I'll, I'll take an action to do that, Todd, then. That'd be great. Good point, thanks. OK, I think then maybe we do have the, the list. So 
uh, are you inviting people to, on this document, start to mark out um, uh, potential duplicates, or is this something Todd will I think Todd was going to go through. Do. Yep, I'll, yeah, I'll take to action for that. Well, I think some of the identification of individuals may be obvious, but then there are some others that are going to be less obvious. And um, I think with the IBM emails, I can probably find a name to match to the email. Gmail accounts are going to be a little bit harder. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's it. Then I think what's next is uh, work group updates, which we haven't done in uh, in a bit. So uh, there's one one more action item there about the hyperledger explorer proposal. Oh, uh, we discussed that. I I, I said. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we tabled it until uh, next week. Ah, okay. Because uh, there is actually a proposal that I had written, but um, uh, Parda was out on vacation and he hasn't reviewed it, and Dan is also not on the call and he was unable to review it yet. So um, we'll, we'll bring that forward next week. Okay, work groups. Oleg, are you on? Maybe not. Okay, let's move on to uh, Rob. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, from the architecture work group, I'm happy to report that we finished our work, first work item. The only pending thing is to uh, finish the documentation for it. Uh, but we completed our first iteration on the um, um, on the functionality breakup between the consensus layer and the business logic layer and the interface between them. Um, so um, we still need to finish up the documentation. We hope to get started on it on the face-to-face -face, um, uh, next week. Um, and we've started discussions. Uh, the next uh, major agenda topic is uh, uh, the security functions. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a still an outstanding item to figure out where the security reviews uh, should be dealt with. So we're not sure whether we should take that on yet. I wanted to bring that up here to get um, you, you know the TSC's input on uh, on the security reviews. Um, we are planning to have um, uh, a fairly long session on the face-to-face. -face. Um, I think uh, we have uh, uh, about six to eight hours that we'd like to have on parallel with the uh, the, the hack fest. Um, so um, we are putting together an agenda for that, and we'll do a doodle poll to kind of figure out uh, which slots would work. Um, so that's about it from my side, uh, and we'd love to get input on uh, you know how we want to go forward uh, uh, with the security review. Um, I'm sure the code uh, review aspects uh, uh, should be handled every uh, somewhere else. In terms of getting the academic research community, uh, both uh, and the industry research community, to look at uh, our uh, crypto uh, framework and um, uh, you know vet it from a security perspective, you know. Uh, is there a more appropriate group than the architecture work group to take that on? Um, you know, do you think we should take it on? So forth. We'd love to get your input on that. Great. Thanks, Ron. Any questions for Ron? Okay, Dave. Um, hi. Yes. So the white paper working group. So I think we're we're actually making some pretty good progress. Now we had a, a meeting yesterday and. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough members for a quorum, myself included. I got called away at the last minute, but um, you know we've we've got uh, uh, quite a, a bit of uh, changes made since the last draft, and um, they're mostly sitting in. You know, you're, we're using Google Docs. We're going through, making suggestions. So we want to just have a quorum to go through, but. If you if you see you know our our new glossary, uh, thank you Nick, uh, uh, has uh, been applied, um, and uh, you know Hart's really been kind of stepping up as I haven't been able to uh, participate as much as I'd like to in the last couple. So uh, you know there's quite a bit of uh, uh, new suggestions that have been reviewed. They all look good. A lot of grammatical improvements, and um, and so you know I'm I mean. 
I think we might be able to be publishing our next draft. Uh, and in fact, it, we might even want to call this first one a, a 1.0 since it seems to have, in, we, we seem to, I believe we are in agreement that we've addressed uh, most of the input, if not all the input suggestions uh, uh, in, in this new version. So hopefully, you know, next week we'll, we'll have a quorum. We'll be able to accept all the suggested edits that have been put in there. And uh, unless there's, you know, a major, um, you know, something missing, holding back, you know, I would expect that we would be able to have an, a new version ready for uh, publish, publishing. And that's it. Thanks, Dave. Any questions for Dave? Somebody's on another conversation and if they can be muted. Um, okay, next up I think was, uh, lost my place here. Um, Christopher, are you on? No. Um, and then finally that would be me. Uh, the CI, so actually made some really good progress. We have, um, you know, Jenkins is basically up and running for x86 I think certainly for the fabric we may be able to transition off of um, Travis pretty soon um, Jenkins seems to be pretty stable for x86 for um, the x390 um, uh, I'm sorry s390 uh, we have a little bit of um, cross compiling issues and things that are being worked out uh, I'm, but I'm hopeful that we can get to the point where that's um, an integral part of our build and our notifications. Right now we're just sort of uh, ignoring uh, that particular branch uh, in terms of merges. Um, and uh, I think there's ongoing work to integrate uh, open power. Um, if, you know, again, if there's interest in adding additional architectures to this, um, you know, please get in touch with myself or Rye, and um, and we'll uh, we'll look to integrate other other architectures into the platform uh, for builds. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, we've got Jira and um, Garrett are both up and running and ready to rock. Um, uh, Rye is out this week. I was actually, I didn't realize he was going to be on vacation. So I was hoping that we could maybe affect the um, transition from GitHub to Garrett for the Fabric projects on uh, Monday. But since he's out and not back in the office technically until Tuesday, uh, it, it looks like we may be doing that, you know, early in the, in the hackathon to actually affect the transition. But that's good because as, as Brian uh, noted, uh, I will be at the hackathon, and so if we have to have any remedial um, handholding for people that are unfamiliar with Garrett uh, or Jira, we should be able to accommodate that. Um, we did start to pull in all the issues from GitHub into Jira, and we found that what it did was it also pulled in all the pull requests, which is kind of weird. Um, I guess I'm, maybe I'm not surprised because pull requests and issues are actually treated very much the same in the GitHub API. Um, you have to actually um, filter them by the type. Um, so I think we have to take a look at that import script and figure out what's what needs to be changed there. But hopefully we should be able to have the, certainly for the Fabric projects, we should be able to um, be up and running on Garrett and Jira, certainly I think by uh, next week. Any other questions for me? If not, then I think we're at end of job. So, uh, unless anybody's got anything else? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And hopefully we'll see uh, a number of you at the face-to-face. -face. Actually, I hope we see all of you at the face-to-face. -face, but. Anyway. I love you too. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.